Good afternoon. Aloha. Uh, welcome to today's roundtable. <clears throat> and I want to thank uh, all of you for being here in person and for those of you who are logging on. I am looking forward to today's discussion on the Alice Spotted Bear and Walter Sobolev Commission's report on Native children. Um, first, some housekeeping logistics matters. If you're participating remotely, Members will be able to see you on the WebEx, so please raise your hand to be recognized if you would like to add a comment or respond to a question, even if it is not directed at you. This is not like a normal hearing. You're allowed to talk more than once, and you're allowed to talk for fewer than five minutes, and <laughs> sometimes more, but really I want to emphasize you're allowed to give a brief answer and not fill up the whole time. Um, we'll try to reciprocate. Uh, please remain on mute until you're recognized and identify yourself as you start to speak so our court reporter accurately picks up who is speaking for the record. And now to introductions. I'll start with our panelists joining us virtually from Hawaii. Delia Ulima, as a member of the Commission's Native Advisory Committee, Delia provided valuable insight to the Commission on the experience of Native Hawaiian youth. Over the past decade, she has worked with Epic Ohana, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving child welfare in Hawaii, and serves as the statewide manager of the High Hopes Initiative. In this role, she's leveraged community partnerships to ensure youth who are in the foster care system have the resources and the opportunities that they need to succeed. Aloha and welcome. I'm not sure where I'm looking. There we go, it's camera. <laughs> We, uh, we also have with us uh, in person, uh, Dr. Tammy Dakoto, um, Vice Chair of the Commission in Bismarck, uh, uh, from uh, Bismarck, North, North Dakota. Anita Feinday, Commissioner from Brainerd, Minnesota. Leander Russ McDonald, Commissioner uh, from Bismarck, uh, North Dakota, uh, virtually joining us. Gil Vigil, Board President of the National Indian Child Welfare Association in Portland, Oregon, joining us virtually, and I now uh, turn um, this round table over to the vice chair who's been a real leader on all of these issues. Um, I am going to ask my staff director to participate fully. Um, I don't want you to take that as a sign of um, diminished support, but rather that we're just cutting out the intermediary because by the end of every one of these round tables, I would be leaning on Jennifer about next steps. She'll be directly engaged with, uh, with the uh, Republican staffers and, and with my um, friend and vice chair, uh, Lisa Murkowski. So uh, vice chair Murkowski. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'm on. Yeah. There we are. There we go. I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. And um, appreciate not only your leadership with us uh, as we have made it through the work of the commission, but also the follow on, because that's where the real work begins. So um, I want to thank everyone for your participation today. Uh, again, those that have, have uh, found their way in person, several of you from a long way to be here. Um, but also for those that are participating online to discuss the Alice Spotted Bear and Walter Sobolov Commission on Native Children. I want to introduce um, a couple of the people on this uh, commission that have um, uh, lent their wisdom to this effort. The chair of the commission, Gloria O'Neill. Gloria is the president and CEO of Cook Inlet Tribal Council. She is a lifelong Alaskan. She is of Yupik, Sami, and Irish descent. She also serves as the CEO of the Alaska Native Justice Center, the Claire Swan Early Head Start Center, and the Get Out the Native Vote. And she is a dear friend, I'm proud to say. I'm also pleased to introduce one of our commissioners, Commissioner Don Gray. Don sits on the board of directors for uh, Yupiak Vig Inupiat Corporation, UIC. He's currently the director of UIC Oil and Gas. He previously served as their senior director for quality, health, safety, environmental training. And I'm also happy to be able to introduce Dr. Sarah Kastelik. She is an enrolled citizen of the native village of Uzinki, who serves as the executive director for the National Indian Child Welfare Association. So she's participating virtually. This is a uh, this is a a, a labor of love in, in many ways. Uh, it was about 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, uh, with my former colleague, Senator Heidi Heitkamp from North Dakota, uh, 
she had talked to me about just exactly this, uh, a commission to focus on our Native children. And so inter legislation was introduced to create this commission. And then in 2016, our bill was signed into law and it marked the beginning of a long overdue national conversation about the state of American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian children. Before we start our discussion on the findings of the report, I want to take a moment to honor Alice Spotted Bear and Walter Sobolev, the commission's namesakes. Alice Spotted Bear was an enrolled member of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation. He was a lifelong educator, a staunch advocate for preservation of Native culture and language, serving as an appointee to the Native Advisory <coughs> Committee on Indian Education. Reverend Walter Sobolev is a leader who I deeply respected, was a distinguished Clinkett elder and educator. I had an opportunity on the Senate floor to honor his legacy. He passed at the ripe old age of 102, but I noted that he was the living embodiment of the history of our great state. In the midst of a time of racial bias, Reverend Sobolev was a vocal advocate for cultural education, human rights, and the rights of indigenous people in Alaska. And I'm grateful that we've been able to honor Alice and Walter's legacy through the work and the findings of this commission. Our hope in creating this commission was to understand how the interconnected problems of poverty, trauma, exposure to violence, and a lack of access to education and healthcare impact Native children. Through the coordination of resources and working together, we want to make sure that we can better hone in on some of the answers to improve policies and programs serving Native children. Throughout my travels in rural Alaska, I hear about the challenging realities that our children and our families are confronted with, although in many cases, the challenges far surpass the immediate solutions. I'm consistently struck, though, with the resilience of Alaska Native families and communities. Throughout rural Alaska, I am moved by the preservation of Alaska Native languages and culture and the strength of our tight-knit communities. On October 26, just a few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to provide introductory remarks at a joint session held on the Commission's findings by the Alaska State Senate Judiciary and Education Committees. I was grateful to see that all levels of government were evaluating the recommendations of the report and thinking through how to increase community level decision making and flexible funding approaches to better serve struggling youth. So I'm pleased to highlight that just last week, S3022, the IHS Workforce Parity Act of 23, was reported out of our committee. This legislation will aim to address the diverse workforce needs of tribal economies, which I know is a key issue contained in this report. And it's just one example of how the Senate Indian Affairs Committee will be working with the commission to evaluate and support the federal recommendations of the report. As I mentioned to Gloria, and as I've just mentioned here, this, this report has been published now, but the work is just really beginning. So thank you again to the participants for being a part of today's discussions, and, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for helping to facilitate it. Thank you. Um, during the round table, we'll discuss the commission study on the unique issues facing Native children and its findings and recommendation on how Congress can step up to serve them. I am particularly interested in hearing from the panel about culturally and community-based juvenile justice and child welfare models, <clears throat> programs that promote Native language and culture, and um, suicide prevention efforts. Um, and so I'll turn it over to our vice chair who will run this meeting. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, again, thank you, and um, uh, we will be sure to to report back working with your team, our, our teams uh, on the committee. I, I'd like to start with a focus on, on the workforce issue, because I think we recognize that um, when our young people are, are empowered uh, with, with opportunities through, um, through employment, it, it really does um, it really does help from a very holistic perspective. We know that our Native students have been underrepresented in post-secondary education. We see the gaps in attainment and employment. Uh, the, the statistic that I saw was that as of 2022, 26% of American Indian Alaska Native youth are earning less than $500 a week. 36% of families with American Indian Alaska Native children have difficulty covering food and housing expenses. And so expanding the employment opportunities for our young people 
whether it's through summer opportunities or year-round opportunities. I think these are efforts that can work to improve work readiness, expand networks, boost earnings, um, certainly reduce interaction with the criminal justice system. There's just so much that is in that. So I was really pleased, and I, I'm going to start off with you, um, Gloria, as uh, CITC has been um, focused on this for a long time through your 477 program. It was featured, I understand, as a case study in the report. You've got the kind of the one-stop shop there. Um, and, and so recognizing what it is that you have done, if you can if you can kind of share whether or not you think that this type of a model um, can be utilized moving forward. And, and, and this is not just for you, but for, for those of you uh, that are present here or, or online, other examples that we can cite to that um, can help us address some of the, the, the workforce challenges, but more importantly, the workforce opportunities. So Gloria, why don't you start kicking it off? Thank you, Senator Murkowski. And I want to just say a heartfelt thank you from our entire Native community for your leadership and vision and Senator Heidi Heidkamp's leadership and vision. As we started this journey six years ago, that's when I started this journey. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah. You have been absolutely unwavering in your support for our children. And I really appreciate that you as a leader and a key decision maker in this country really steps up and you're a true advocate for our children because we all want, you know, the well-being of our communities. And many of us say, and I hear it time and time again, it's really our success is in our future generations. And what this report and this body of work really allows us to do and has allowed us to do is travel the country and hear from all the regions of the country what is it that our kids need for their well-being and for their success. And what's amazing to me, as I said to you when the report was finished, is that our kids know what they need. Yeah. Our kids are so resilient. And I think out of everything that I have learned, I was most inspired by knowing that when our kids know who they are and where they come from and they have the right supports, mm -hmm. they can do anything in the world. And so that's why CITC has leaned in to really pushing forward a flexible model of funding through the 477 vehicle. And what we've really been able to do is not only focus on the individual, but the family, and create career pathways. And what 477 um, and uh, compacts and contracts allow us to do is braid funding, making sure that we're accountable for those broader uh, federal um, regulations, but braid funding. So at the end of the day, what's most important for us is the success of our youth and self-determination of our communities. And what better way for self-determination of an individual or family is when they have a real real career pathway. So through 477, we're able to create summer youth programs. And what we've been able to do is really think about innovation and think about technology. Like what are the jobs for today? And through partnerships with various industries across the state, we've been able to align those career pathways through what we call a super fab lab. And i um, not sure you know, if many people know what a fab lab is, but it's a place of bringing the latest technology and where young people learn that technology and they're able to create and dream. And we bring employers, we bring job skills into that place. So when youth spend time with us after school, during summers that they really have um, a standard of skills that they need 
to thrive in this world, regardless of what they choose to do. So we really think about how we take the young person from the classroom into those work skills, making sure that it's modern technology that they have access to, and then creating a career pathway through various industry across the state. So technology is, is key. Um, and I, I, I'm going to find myself looking to those oh. in, in the room because it's just human nature. But those of you that are online, please do not hesitate to, to jump into to this because I can't see you. Do we have one of those hand raise functions? Or? We do. Okay, so you'll let me know if there's somebody that raises their hand. And Dr. McDonald, who's online, is our education expert, and I know he would like to share as well. Okay, I think that's a cue up to you, Dr. McDonald. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Russ McDonald. I'm uh, president for United Tribes Technical College, located uh, in Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, good to see everyone here and glad to uh, see this uh, report completed. And, and we're really pleased that uh, you're allowing us to share a few thoughts and uh, from the, this important work that we've uh, been a part of. Um, before, I, before I get into a couple uh, responses, uh, the first thing that, uh, that I think I'd like to mention is that when we look at education of tribal peoples, when we look at uh, skill development, workforce development, uh, there's the importance of culture within in, in what happens. We need to have culture as a foundation in order for uh, to in order to implement uh, curriculum pedagogy into uh, into our systems and, and allow it for our students to to, uh, to gain the skills, our people to gain the skills they need in order to uh, get a job in the workforce or to uh, go on to higher education from what we're providing. So I think that's a that's a that's primary, and we we see that, and we it's a, it's in the research literature. Uh, those. Uh, students who are more familiar with their culture are more likely to succeed academically. So I think that's an important uh, piece that that overall theme that came out of this out of this good work. Um, but we were really impressed as a commission by how much workforce development and financial stability can move the levers of life course outcomes for Native children and youth. Several recommendations directly uh, addressing this issue was uh, recommend, re recommendation 15 uh, to expand opportunities in higher education for Native students. The, this recommendation urges that for a first degree or a tu certification, tuition and fees should be free for Native students. Importantly, the recommendation uses the definition in the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act, which includes short term certifications that lead to high pay and jobs. Here at United Tribes Techno College, we have a native student tuition waiver that we implement them for students that are coming in the door uh, and throughout their, their time here, as long as they maintain a grade point average and are uh, and, uh, enrolled members of federally recognized tribes. But there's other examples out there along those lines to include uh, the Minnesota free tuition programs at all state and community colleges which is found on pages uh, 50 and 51 of the report. And also uh, mentioned in the report is our college, United Tribes Technical College, and other tribal colleges in here in the state. And we have a apprenticeship program uh, that we think is a, is a great model. And we're working with North Dakota University System, or one of the colleges from the North Dakota University System, which is Lake Region State College. And we, uh, what we've done is we've taken a Department of Labor certified apprenticeship programs and implemented that at each of the tribal colleges. And for the first year of funding that we received from, uh, from the oil industry partners is uh, to do this work to really perhaps build the workforce for that area. And, but, the, but we're really focused on building the model. And so each of the colleges uh, chose two vocations uh, for these apprenticeships. And we're starting out with two students uh, per year. And so we, and, um, in regard to the programs here at United Tribes, we chose business administration and uh, computer information technology. So those two are being implemented and, uh, and we're just finishing up the first year of that. It's going very well. There's tuition, fees, and books covered within that program, as well as uh, daycare costs, uh, gas cards to make sure they're getting to school. There's a rental assistance piece for those that have been in here in town. And so it's really, it's, it's uh, and, and what we're seeing is that um, for these students, it's just been a tremendous opportunity for them uh, to go to school and they're excelling and they're doing great. 
and they're having real life experiences uh, within a within a workplace that it, that's enhancing their 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 coursework within within a classroom. Uh, another example is the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium uh, with the health, dental, and behavioral health aids. We know that that's uh, we know that uh, that's been well known as a model. We think that needs to be continued as far as uh, especially where rural communities are concerned. And then uh, moving on, recommendation 27, create incentive to expand and strengthen the workforce serving Native children and youth. This recommendation calls attention to the dearth of providers across education, health, child welfare, and juvenile justice, and the need to improve the quality and the quantity of both Native and non-Native workforces for our tribal populations. Um, in education, promising models from Oregon demonstrate that a commitment to increasing Native teachers resulted in 100 Native teachers across uh, Oregon. Here within our state, Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, uh, Turtle Mountain Community College, uh, they have a, a, a teacher program there. And what's happened there at Turtle Mountain is kind of a phenomenon, but 95% of the teacher workforce on the Turtle Mountain Reservation are enrolled members of that tribe. That's awesome. It's a big yeah. So so great things happening out there, and I think uh, all this is included within the report. Yeah, I, I appreciate so many of the points that you've raised. You know, you you mentioned the apprenticeship program, and we've been trying to work through a national apprenticeship program here um, more holistically. But one of the biggest takeaways that we got, and this was very relevant to Alaska, but I think but in any rural area, is that one of the great barriers to people participating in these trades apprenticeships was no access to childcare and the travel cost to get from their village to where the, the training was gonna happen. Everybody wanted the training, but it's some of the simple things um, that keep people out and um, when you can't, when you can't get the training because you you perhaps have a, a couple little ones that um, somebody's got to be taken care of. These are these are some of the barriers. I want to just there's so many things in this report that I want to try to to get us to, and so it may seem like we're jumping around, but um, you all have spent five years working on this, so I'm I'm sure you want to get to 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 the, to the chance to articulate some of, of what you have gleaned from it. Um, talking about the, the issues related, the hard stuff, issues related to um, domestic violence, the chairman mentioned his interest in uh, uh, you know, those, those ways that we can provide for better health, mental health outcomes, how we reduce the alarming rate of, of suicide amongst our young, our young people. Um, and it is, it, is, is, it is certainly challenging. One of the things that um, really got my attention um, was an article that was published in the Anchorage Daily News last fall, and it highlighted the links between um, Alaska's maternal mortality rates, which are very, very high, and the connection to, to domestic violence. And um, uh, it, it, it is, it's, it's one of those, um, one of those very troubling areas that's hard, hard to discuss, hard to talk about. Uh, it's not something that is unique, of course, to, to Alaska, but, um, what we can do here at the federal level to, um, to, to, I guess, draw attention to this linkage, this intersection between domestic violence and maternal mortality uh, that we see experienced at higher rates by, by Native American women. Um, you do have a recommendation in the report um, about the need to provide comprehensive prenatal health education uh, to Native American mothers and families. Um, and I, I don't know if this is one to, to send to you, Tammy, but um, again, these are, these are things that we look to and say, are there some things that we can do at the federal level uh, that can help um, shine a light on, on this and help 
um, help address what I think we all recognize is, is very deeply troubling. Yeah, thank you for that question. This is an area that I've spent my career you know, focusing on and very passionate about. Um, I, I think the gist of this area, the recommendations in this area, is anything that we do to support early childhood development, including in utero development and the mother, um, has exponential benefits um, to the developing child. Um, and so the, the recommendations focus first on, as you said, providing comprehensive prenatal health education and related services. And those range from anything from breastfeeding education to screening for physical um, obesity, toxins, um, substance use, um, education about fetal, alcohol, fetal alcohol's impact and fetal development. Um, and the... Anything that we do to reduce the pregnant mother's stress is also a very important factor because what we understand now through our neuroscience is that um, when mom is under chronic stress, she's exposed to chronic levels of stress hormones that cross the placental barrier and have negative impacts on how the baby is developing. Um, and those impacts can have long-term consequences for children. So in, you know, supporting mom during pregnancy um, and then post-pregnancy, um, and especially when these strategies are anchored in culture and promote tribal control, we see the most benefit that augments the success of those programs. So again, um, promoting that physical, mental health and um, at the prevention and intervention le level. Um, as you all probably know, the intimate partner violence rates for um, Native women are roughly 50%, and those have increased since COVID um, for all women, um, but also for Native women. And so, um, the, the recommendation is f regarding um, intimate partner violence and maternal mortality also includes early childhood home visiting programs. Again, get, bringing the services to mom and bringing the services to child and family um, and um, emphasizing the importance of utilizing practice-based evidence and not just evidence-based practices because we do know when we heard over and over on in, through our commission um, hearings, um, there are so so many really successful and innovative, creative, culturally based, community based programs that work for tribes that really reflect the health needs of the specific community. Um, and so those are things like the uh, maternal, infant and early childhood home visiting programs. Um, there was a case study that, that is in the commission report about the Menominee tribe um, developing a program where their tribal health department brought the services to the school. So both mental and dental and physical health services, they created a trauma-informed counseling space for youth. Um, they brought dental services. Um, what they found was um, some intended consequences that youth tooth decay declined and the rates of children without any tooth decay increased quite a bit, but there were unintended consequences as well. Um, there was a significant reduction overall in teen pregnancies among their adolescents. They also saw reduced substance use among youth as they were getting support and services and access to education about substance abuse, reduction in school suspension, um, and increased use of behavioral health visits. Um, and so these are the types of programs that, that um, we see as a commission to be most helpful in Indian country in addressing this area of need. So uh, let me ask on that because Oftentimes, our challenge is high need um, but limited access to the professionals, whether it's behavioral health specialists, um, uh, the prenatal uh, specialists. To what extent, going back to Gloria's point about how we utilize technology, to what extent can we count on um, telehealth or teleeducation in order to reach more more families, more children, more schools. I, I, if there's anything good that came out of COVID is we began to formalize and expand our ability to utilize 
telehealth, telemedicine, medicine, and virtual services, and um, licensing boards, educational um, systems sort of opened up their requirements to allow for supervision and training to occur through these methods. Um, and so I think that more and more those are becoming viable options. Um, in my clinic, we began using telehealth during COVID. I was nervous about that. I didn't think that was going to be a good um, method, um, particularly for adolescents. Um, and it turns out adolescents spend all their time on their screens anyway. And so it was very natural for them to be receiving mental health services on via telehealth. And so it really has, it's not always ideal deal for everyone, but it has worked very, very well, especially for our rural, underserved, difficult to access students. Um, the, the, the other thing that we found is that when we bring those services to the school, and there's a school counselor that can help us um, make referrals to us that can get us um, paperwork from parents that can help us make contact with caregivers and um, are just integrated into the work that we're doing, then students are being seen in a safe and stable environment with access to a supportive counselor via telehealth services um, through an agency that's off of the, the reservation or off of the tribal community. So I think those are really good, viable options that are becoming more and more available. Sure, is that on? There. Most of the case studies that we have in the report reflects new models and partnerships. And, and I think the use of technology is absolutely key that um, as we look at vehicles like contracting, compacting, 477, Tawahe, those flexible vehicles allow local communities to receive funds, to braid funds appropriately, integrate them, and really respond to the need of the community. And as Dr. Dakota said, meet people where they are. So I think they're all tools in our toolbox, but thinking outside the box, and in most cases, I think the best programs are ones where the tribe, the tribal organization, worked on a regional basis, or they worked with their state, or they worked in integrating direct services into public schools. And so it, it is about looking at the whole individual, using all the tools, and meeting people where they are. One of the things that we've got to work on on our end is making sure then that the way that the services are delivered, the reimbursement for that services isn't impacted because it's done by telephone or virtually. So uh, we get that one. Let's shift over to, to, to public safety. Um, uh, we were all kind of focused this past weekend. May 5th was recognized as murdered, missing indigenous uh, women's <laughs> awareness. Um, this is something that uh, has really allowed me to, to focus in on the public safety crisis that impacts so many of our, of our tribal communities. Um, so now we've got the Native, the Native Children's Commission report, we've got the Not Invisible Commission report, and, and one of the things that came from the Not Invisible report was the importance of partnerships um, between tribal communities, tribal governments, the relevant organizations that are then focused on prevention and, and support services. But let's talk a little bit about the intersection between the recommendations uh, around child welfare and juvenile justice and, and the priorities that we've been looking at here in the committee to support public safety. And, uh, um, and, and as we're doing that, I'm, I'm going to throw this out to Sarah um, to, to talk about the importance of the recommendations um, um, in the report about the child welfare system. We know that the proportion of Native children in the foster care system is, is, is out of whack. It's disproportion, disproportionate to the general population, 2.8 times uh, their proportion, and by age 18, one in four of these children subject to maltreatment investigation. And so we know our statistics are not, not where we need them to be. So Sarah, if you can speak to some of these issues 
about the child welfare system and, and the integration as it relates to, to public safety. And then I'm, I'm, I want to throw that out to others as well because I, I know that this is a, a very key one for so many of you. Diana, thank you, uh, Chairman, Vice Chairwoman, uh, committee members, commission members, and colleagues. Really appreciate this uh, wonderful report um, and appreciate all of the hard work that went into it, the commitment of the commission members, the staff who helped to write the report, and um, such significant engagement of tribal communities from across the country. So uh, we're very pleased with the report and wholeheartedly support uh, the many recommendations here. Um, I think the, the perspective of the report in really looking uh, comprehensively, holistically at the needs of children is such an important strength. And the theme around uh, tribal sovereignty being the key, uh, tribal self-determination in identifying uh, culturally based services that will best meet the needs of families and children is so important in this work. So, um, you know, we we're just talking briefly about partnerships. And I think in this area as well, partnerships are key. And um, I'm also really excited to point out that um, the way to move this report forward in terms of very actionable things uh, that Congress can do right now, um, there are just so many of these. And, and so I wanted to take a moment to just point out two things. Um, right now, um, the Congress, as you know, is working on a reauthorization of Title IV-B of the Social Security Act, and so those are child welfare programs, um, and uh, they're under the jurisdiction of the Senate Finance Committee. And several of the bills uh, that are being considered for inclusion uh, in the reauthorization um, directly impact the recommendations here. So I feel like they're really viable ways to carry forward some of the important recommendations in this report. Uh, one of those bills that's being considered for inclusion is the Tribal Family Fairness Act, uh, which is HR 2762. And this is a bipartisan bill that would increase funding for tribal child welfare programs and court improvement programs. Uh, so this would increase funding and at the same time seek to streamline administrative requirements requirements to better align the requirements of the grants with the, the grant amount that tribes actually receive. So the average grant amount that tribes receive for this program is, is under $30,000 per year. And not even every tribe in the country is eligible to receive these funds. Um, and these are preventive services uh, that are funded by this funding stream. So it's really critical that, uh, that tribes have access to this um, funding stream, which strengthens families and ultimately allows tribes to uh, support children safely at home with their families. So to prevent the entry into foster care whenever possible. Um, so that, that bill is really important for us to lift up uh, right now. A second bill that I would briefly mention um, in conjunction with Title IV B reauthorization is another bipartisan bill. It's the Strengthening Tribal Families Act, which is H.R. 3461. And um, this legislation uh, really leans into partnerships. So it, it does a number of important things. This bill would direct HHS to collect data on the implementation of the Indian Child Welfare Act that can be used to inform data-driven technical assistance for states and tribes. So this kind of data could support better collaboration, better tribal state relationships, uh, better collaboration in the implementation of ICWA's requirements. Um, and, and this kind of um, this kind of direction is really important uh, because uh, HHS isn't currently playing this kind of role and we think there's a huge opportunity for that to happen. So this kind of clarity to HHS about its role, the encouragement for HHS and Interior to work together to provide technical assistance to tribes and states in 
better supporting ICWA implementation is really critical and it's especially critical in places where there isn't a strong history of productive working relationships between states and tribes. So we think um, leaning into this theme around partnership, really thinking about tribal capacity. Uh, we know that increasing tribal capacity is one of the surest ways to holistically impact the well being of kids, and in particular, uh, to keep kids safely at home, to uh, build uh, the services and supports around them and their families that prevent entry into the foster care system, that actually make it unnecessary to remove kids from their families. So there are a number of uh, important bills that are already in play uh, that the committee could look to to move forward some of these important recommendations about uh, really honoring tribal sovereignty, increasing the capacity of tribes um, to deliver services that best meet the needs of families and kids. So, Kuyana, thank you. Kuyana, Sarah, I really appreciate that you've, you have given specific assignments here by, by two, two bills that we can follow through with. I understand that uh, Delia would like to join into this part of the conversation on child welfare. Yes, mahalo Vice Chair, aloha to the committee and to all of my colleagues here today. Um, it's an honor to be here representing Hawaii and Native Hawaiians. Um, my work for the last 15 years or so has been in child welfare reform here in Hawaii. And although Native Hawaiian children um, don't fall under ICWA, so it's very unique. Uh, our needs are very similar to our um, Native American and Alaska Native uh, cousins and children, and yet we don't have the same sorts of, definitely not self-determination um, or tribal sovereignty, um, or the kinds of protections uh, that ICWA has. And so the onus falls upon our department, our child welfare department, which is run by the state, it's central, centralized, throughout all of Hawaii, to really uplift those kinds of cultural supports that are most important um, to benefiting Native Hawaiian children and youth. Over 45% of children in the foster care system in Hawaii are Native Hawaiian. And Native Hawaiians only make up about 21 to 23% of the total population, but about 30 or so percent of the children or minor children under 18. So a significant disproportionality. Some of the things though that have worked well, uh, which I feel this commission or this committee can support is funding around kin placement support. So we have a very high rate of kin placement in Hawaii. Almost 60% of our children placed in foster care are with family or kin. Because of the efforts through service providers like Epic Ohana, uh, contracts with child welfare um, that include Ohana conferencing or family group decision making for every child that enters the system, family finding right away when a child enters the system, seeking family that might uh, provide viable homes for the home uh, for the children so they're not separated from their communities and their families and so there's a number of practices in hawaii that are promising nationwide and that the nation can look to to support native hawaiian uh, native children involved in the foster care system the last thing i'd like to point to is the family first so in Hawaii, um, because the Family First requires, there are requirements around evidence-based programs being utilized. Uh, you know, culture-based programs find very difficult to meet the requirements um, that are that would allow them to receive funding through Family First. However, because culture and family and ohana is so important to us in Hawaii, um, the departments required that the uh, service providers that serve our families do provide culturally responsive uh, supports for our families and do include birth parents and families. So it's more of a family centered approach because that's very important to us in Hawaii. So those are just a few of the things I've, I'd like to uplift, including the importance of youth voice. I have run youth boards for the last 15 years, uh, made up of current and former foster youth between the ages of 14 and 26. And the solutions that we're seeking, that we continue to seek, must include the voices of lived expertise of young people as well as birth parents and families involved in the child welfare system. Mahalo. Mahalo, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm gonna throw this out to uh, anyone that would care to address it, but um, uh, we've, we've discussed some of the statistics that are out there with regards to um, our youth that are uh, 
uh, adjudicated or confined in our ju local justice systems, representing 72% of the total population for men, 28% for women. Um, uh, if, if, if there is any one of you that would like to speak to the intersection between the recommendations contained in the report on juvenile justice reform and in supporting not only our efforts on MMIW, but also uh, supporting our tribal courts. Don, you want to jump in on that? Thank you. Um, I, I would need to put your... Am I on? Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. I would echo a lot of the sentiment that's already been passed. Um, I, would, I would add that there should never be a situation where Native children are um, institutionalized or put into a detention center for being homeless. Um, and that we should really kind of go back to some of the recommendations of, of repurposing and growing our um, community-based programs and, and allowing for the repurposing of juvenile detention centers into <laughs> becoming uh, treatment centers that focus on prevention, um, looking at how do we um, moving into the future, allow our schools to become community-based uh, or uh, community-based programs where they can host um, um, online telehealth, and we can have you know healthcare on-site or mental health services being um, facilitated by um, the t the teachers within the school and using those those telehealth resources that are available that were that are being pushed throughout. Um, all of the Indian country and in, in getting people connected. So I um, think as a product of an individual that was um, forcibly taken away, um, that some of those resources would have been had would have been a, a significant um, advantage had some of those things been in place. That wasn't really articulate. <laughs> I'll turn it over to uh, Mike. Thank you, Don. Thank you. I would just add, um, Senator, um, my experience comes from serving as a children's courts judge for my tribe for many years and um, making the connection between children in foster care and MMIW. We know that kids in foster care are often uh, go on to become MMIW, and so there's a high correlation. And so kids in foster care um, often do not have uh, that connection to their family, so their family doesn't know they're missing. Um, that it's it's not they're not made aware. So I would just make that connection, and I wanted to thank um, Sarah Kostelik for her recommendations, and uh, just mention funding tribal courts, keeping these cases in uh, with the tribe, so and, and providing the resources to tribal courts so that they can transfer these cases from state courts and have the capacity to hear these cases in tribal courts and have the capacity to provide prevention, but also mental health services, the services um, that our youth need on the reservation. So I would um, say that I think that's an integral part of, um, of reducing the numbers and, um, and focusing on prevention to keep families together. And um, we know that a lot of, there are a lot, have been a lot of innovations, um, drug courts, uh, family uh, prevention courts, so fo providing additional funding so that the use of those uh, courts can be expanded. Yeah, I think we've seen some, some good successes with, with drug courts, but the, 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 the tribal courts and the role that they can play too, I think we're looking at with, with, with great interest there. On the, um, on the substance use behavioral health, and, and, and Tammy, you had spoken to this uh, earlier on the uh, behavioral health issues, but we had a hearing in committee, um, uh, I guess it was last, last winter, on um, the impact of fentanyl in uh, our native communities. And we're making the news in Alaska in terms of, of a shocking uh, increase of, of overdoses and, uh, uh, un unfortunately, 
Um, it is it is everywhere. It's not just in the cities. It's out to some of the small small uh, rural, uh, predominantly native villages where the villages themselves are are being targeted because they can they can sell the product at 200 times the rate of what you could get a pill for in in uh, in Seattle, and it's killing our people. You know that as well as anyone. But when we when we think about how we can work across federal agencies to to provide the funding that our our, our tribes and the tribal organizations um, could utilize to help prevent some of these these tragedies that we're seeing in our communities, prevent these overdose um, deaths. As, as, as we look to that, does, does the commission report focus in on, on ways that we can better, better partner and better leverage the dollars that exist? Um, yes, I, I think it's important to remember that substance abuse um, is often a symptom of trauma. It's trauma um, impacts the nervous system in such a way that the person cannot feel safe. Um, and so they're searching for substances outside of themselves to regulate what they can't regulate on their own. So it's really a disease of disconnection, if you will. And, and when we're talking about justice systems, justice systems unfortunately have a way of further disconnecting our youth rather re than reconnecting them to the things that matter that would reduce um, that would reduce their propensity for substances. Um, but I, I think the report addresses the need also for so trauma-informed services, restorative justice. Of course, that is brain built, rebuilding. Um, the 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 youth cannot a person cannot learn um, because their brain is not optimized until they can feel safe in their body. And so, establishing programs where youth can feel connected, can feel regulated, um, and can then are ready for learning new behaviors because punishment only reduces unwanted behaviors behavior doesn't change or increase um, uh, the uh, desirable behavior. Um, but the, the recommendations also address the need for integrative, comprehensive braiding fund, braided funding sources um, so that systems can work in a really collaborative um, way to, um, to develop more comprehensive programs. I think a good example of that is what we see going on in North Dakota with MHA Nation's Good Road to Recovery program that provides treatment beyond the typical 30-day rehabilitation program, but really for the longer term. And, and of course, it is culturally based and language based and um, it's, um, tribally controlled, um, but it's a program that provides um, longer term recovery services and then helps the individual integrate back into society through rehabilitative and safe housing programs, all the while allowing them to continue to have access and in some cases even house with their family members while they're receiving services. Go ahead, Don. I'd also add that I think it's important to recognize that substance abuse and domestic violence is not a part of our culture. It's not a part of who we are. That is passed, um, passed down trauma and it's legacy trauma that's been passed down to us. So um, I think trauma, the in, importance of trauma-informed care at all levels of touch points throughout a child's um, existence, at school, at the healthcare facilities, at the, their counselors, every area where um, it, uh, people are interacting with our native children, they should be trauma informed, right? And, and um, be able to help guide those children at a community level um, and on a community based um, healing. Gloria? This is a real tragic um, topic, as you said, in many of our communities. Um, my niece, who was 26, 27 years old, last February went out with her friends one night and died because she purchased drugs and it was laced with fentanyl. Mm. This was a young Alaska Native girl who was a superstar athlete. 
Uh, she was record holder in most of the NYO events. She was also well known throughout the country. And I, you know, I, I, I really had to stop to think about what are we doing in our community? Because this was somebody close to me. And, you know, I think that talking about it is really important. Talking about it not only in the, in the social service uh, field and providers, but talking about it amongst leadership. And what it really pushed me to do was double down and look at how we were um, approaching treatment on a comprehensive level, making sure that you know Narcan kits are available, they save a lot of lives, are available wherever they can be available, um, that we had access, 24-7 access to care, that's really, really important. Whether it's a hotline, whether it's um, educating families and communities about how um, you know deadly this drug is, um, you know I think it's just it takes all of us in the community. And when I think about the recommendations of the report, like Dr. Dakota said, is again is empowering the local community so that we have the tools that we can take up and say to our young people, start conversations, making sure those kits are available, making sure treatment options are available, meeting people where they are. Because I tell you what, with my niece, it was it was an incredible tragedy. And um, I've never been to a service where at the Heritage Center, we had over 1,500 people show up, mainly young people. And you think about the impact this has on our communities. And when we lose a young person in our community and the, um, the, that short life, I think about what Autumn could have done beyond, you know, where, where she, she ended being in this world with us. Well, thank you for, for sharing um, clearly a very uh, emotional story, but it's not a story, it's your family. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is where fentanyl is, is so, so frightening. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a new effort, catchy phrase, one pill can kill. Um, but that's what we're talking oh. about here. There's a, uh, there's a woman, um, Stevie Ray Anguson. The Anguson family out of Neck Neck is, is very well known. This is a fishing village in, in Bristol Bay, but she has widely shared her story on the impact of drugs in her community and how she had experienced two overdose deaths um, in this small... Uh, in, in her small community. I mean, there's 800 people or something like that in, in, in Knack Knack. Um, she had struggled with addiction, um, uh, hard, hard story. There are so many of them, but she, um, she had a, a child at, at 19, is working in the fishing industry, basically spends all of her money on heroin um, until there was nothing left. Now she is a successful, young woman and mom, she's been sober for about five years, but she says, I'm just so thankful that fentanyl was not around when I was struggling with, with drugs because I'd be dead, mm -hmm. basically. And so how we, how we seek to educate and do so really, really quickly is, is so important. And we're, we've got different initiatives here at the federal level that we're working to to try to advance, um, in my view, we can't move fast enough because as we speak, there's something even more lethal than fentanyl that is now getting out on the streets. And it's just a matter of time before it too is, is cheaper and more readily available. And, and um, it's hard to imagine something that is even more lethal, but this is, this is where we are and how, how we're able to, to provide for that level of education is hard. 
Don, you, you point to the generational trauma issues as they relate to substance abuse. But I think one of the things that we're finding with, with something like fentanyl is that it doesn't necessarily take a, a history of substance abuse to be killed by fentanyl. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the shocking reality of, of, of where of where we are, and unfortunately, far too many of our native people around the country are falling victim to this. I wanna, I wanna talk about something that I think is a little more uplifting, and that is language revitalization and, and preservation of cultures, and it's something that Chairman Schatz had, had mentioned in his comments as something that he hoped would be an outcome of this round table. Uh, there was some there was some re, uh, examples and recommendations for things that we can do to better engage native youth with their their cultures and their languages not only when they're young we've got great examples of some of the immersion schools whether it's it's up in Kotzebue, uh, the the curriculum that comes out of of uh, sea Alaska heritage with the baby raven reads um, I'm going to be participating in, in a couple weeks uh, at, at Celebration, which is a, a beautiful coming together of, of, of Native peoples throughout the region in just nothing but dance and song and drumming for days. And, and I, think, I think just thinking about that, uh, again, uplifts me and I am, I'm only adopted into the Deshitan tribe. But um, I'd, I'd like to hear from uh, you as commissioners about some of the recommendations for, for how we can um, uplift our native children with a focus on, on language and, and just the strength of the culture. And I know that there's probably a few of you online that have not yet spoken, don't, again, hesitate to, to wave in here. Anita, do you want to go first? Thank you. I, I would, um, Don talked about um, domestic violence not being a part of our culture. And so I think that um, focusing on what is our culture and the strengths of our culture and um, and I've I've seen you at AFN, Senator, uh, at the dances in the evenings. I'm not and, very good, but I have enthusiasm. <laughs> and we know uh, we know how uplifting and um, those dances were. So to me, that's kind of a, a, the epitome of the strength of culture and the strength of um, our own communities. And we also know that. Um, a, language as not only just the words, but language also includes the culture, that the language, the words um, convey meaning beyond just um, the simple um, word, that culture is uh, imbued in the language that, and so preservation of language, we know really provides um, uh, resiliency for children, and we know that there are several successful child care and uh, early childhood programs that are based on indigenous languages, and those programs really show great promise in developing children, the strength of children, and, and their resiliency through culture and language. So we know that that's true, and expanding the... Um, availability of those programs, I think, is, um, is really important. I'm going to turn to Gil. I want to just add on to what you have said there, because I, I, have, I have benefited from the experience with my kids who were part of a, a language immersion elementary school. It, their immersion was Spanish, but they, they taught me and, and I think about the, the value of, of a young child um, going home to talk to perhaps a parent 
that doesn't know the language, but grandma still knows. And, and again, the connections and a revitalization of that language all throughout the, uh, the spectrum. Gil, if you, wanna, if you wanna weigh in on language and culture. Thank you, Chairwoman Markulski. Um, a greeting in my Tewa language. My name is Gil V. Hill, and I'm the president of the National Indian Child Welfare Association, but I'm also the executive director of the Eight Northern Indian Public Council. You see our logo in my background. Uh, and I guess my comments are in all areas that was just been presented. Uh, I think one of the important part that our executive director, Sarah, talked about was partnership. Uh, our Indian Child Welfare Association begun to do that uh, more like, not recently, but early on, because we felt our work was not just child welfare, but expanded to all areas that you have been mentioning already. And, and so we expanded, and uh, I guess an example of our success there is if you have gone to our conference, we have educators there, we have social workers there, we have any child welfare workers there, a broad spectrum of individuals because the issues are the same, because our concerns for our children are the same. And for too long, we ourselves have been working in silos and we were not communicating with each other of how to address all the issues that was being presented today. Um, also, before I move on, to be, re be respectful, uh, again, uh, Chairman Schatz, thank you uh, for uh, opening the session. Uh, and then the commission, uh, members of the committee, as well as the members of the commission. Uh, first of all, thank you for the work that you engaged in the last few years. Uh, NICWO has been involved with, I think, from the onset when the bill was first passed. And so many, many of our board members throughout the, the, the whole process uh, provided testimony at different areas. Uh, I provided testimony in Albuquerque when you were in Albuquerque. So our, our board has been involved in all the issues that have been discussed. And so we are willing to support and help in the efforts to move forward. Uh, because I think your title to move forward is the probably the right phrase to put in there. Uh, and then going to back to the issues of uh, cultural uh, practices, if you will, I have to go back to making this point. For too long, federal government or society itself has denied tribal lifestyle, tribal ways. Uh, I'm also from the Tezuki Pueblo here in New Mexico. And if you don't know where Tosuki Pueblo is, geographically, we're located 10 miles north of Santa Fe, over the hill. In fact, we still consider Santa Fe our ancestral home. And the reason I say that is because we were removed from there by the conquistadors. We were denied our cultural practices, our traditional ways. And we lost a lot of it. And not just Pueblo, but a lot of the tribes throughout the country have been subjected to those same things. Same laws, federal law, federal policy, uh, and even some policies that were are, are being developed. And, and and before I go further, again, thank you, uh, senators uh, and and Congress for moving forward with legislation that's going to benefit the tribes. But don't forget, come talk to us because we are the ones that are going to be implanted, implemented, or effected in the long run. So you need to have our voices heard because too long to legislation is passed that does not include our voices and it becomes more of a hindrance than assistance. And so the partnerships that we're developing certainly would be Congress and the senators and our representatives to work along each other, uh, each other to address the issues. So going back to cultural practices because of things that have happened to us. A lot of us have lost our traditional cultural ways. We are bringing those back, but it's, it's come a long ways. So to go back three, 400 years is the challenge. So while we feel in cultural practice is important, and it is, uh, also I forgot to mention 
I'm also the executive director of Aid and Order in the Public Council, and we have programs that we administer from behavioral health to um, our peacekeepers program, which is our domestic violence program. We have education program, child care, Head Start. Uh, we have environmental programs. We have food distribution, senior program. So I administer all those things. In, and so one of our efforts at Eight Northern, after we did a community asset mapping, and basically the community asset mapping, we asked three questions. What's working in your community? What's not working in your community? And how would you like to see your community in the future? And the first thing that came out of our community asset mapping was language culture loss. And so we figured that in order for us to teach our culture and language, we've got to infuse early learning centers. And so that was one of our initiatives to develop early learning centers so that they can teach language and culture and all the other uh, experiences a youth needs to have. But the, all along the same line, so we de developed a, uh, I don't know, we call it, we were calling it decolonizing ourselves. And basically what it was, is was just bringing sensitivity, awareness uh, to our, our staff that work for the nine, eight pueblos in New Mexico, and just to make sure that they know who they were serving. And so with those efforts, we started talking about our history, about how far we've come. We talked about our Pueblo history, uh, the Pueblo Revolt, if you're not familiar with 1680, the first revolution on this continent for independence from a foreign nation, which the Pueblo Revolt represents. And we still have that uh, celebration on an annual basis. But so my point again, bringing culture uh, is really important, but it, it belongs back to the people themselves of those communities to develop those programs. And I think the effort is out there. Uh, the language program, the the language um, act that was passed, the Mary Esther um, Martinez uh, language uh, program uh, act is really important because it allows tribes to get funding to teach their children the languages from their own communities. So education, language is important. Uh, on on the, the note with uh, um, fentanyl, we're realizing that too. Uh, and all other drugs that our, our people are, are being affected by. Uh, unfortunately, I just lost a cousin uh, on Monday uh, due to alcoholism and being homeless. And so each one of us are impacted in one way or another. So those are, are issues for us. Um, and I wanna uh, thank Dr. McDonald for his effort on training uh, youth in the, at, at uh, uh, trying to think of his college now, Sente, no, not Sente, United Tribes, United Tribes, because that's the sort of dilemma we have also because many of our children, our youth, don't want to go get an education. Uh, we, we try to encourage them to get an education, but somehow they're not willing to get an education. And I think that's when they're choosing the, the negative lifestyle of abusing alcohol or drugs and, and all these things that contribute to a, a bad lifestyle. So we're looking here, and COVID also impacted us. In our behavior health network, we've lost a lot of clinicians because of overwork. They were getting burnt out, and there's not very many out there today. And so we're trying to encourage uh, apprenticeship, uh, technical schools to talk, and we, we're, we're looking at the concept of community health aids, behavioral health aids that uh, Dr. Uh, mentioned and their, their programs. We're trying to instill that here at uh, our, our local communities, involve them to educate our kids into some pro, uh, pro program. And we're trying to put them, we're also using we Oya, the Work Enforcement Opportunities Act, to bring kids in and put them into specific job areas to train them, and then eventually to hire them in those positions, because those are the things that we need right now and we're lacking those things. So again, uh, you know, Gil, I want to I want to thank you. I'm going to interrupt because we are um, uh, past our our allotted time here. So we're going to to be wrapping. I want to make sure that in the final, like literally three minutes that we have total, that we're able to to kind of give a summation. I'll begin with Gloria here. So, so we're looking 
how to move the way forward ahead. Um, and uh, we had a been having conversations about this. I want to acknowledge the work of Dr. Jorgensen, who's in the room with us today, who led this writing effort and organizing effort from the Native Nations Institute, along with Ms. Lisa Rieger. Um, we will become, we submitted our report in February. The three months will be uh, May 20th, so that's when uh, the commission is work is finished. Um, there is some money still, you know, there, uh, but our work is finished. And what we would like to do, Senator, is uh, work with you and your staff and the committee staff to think about how we can actually push this report out. We think there's a lot of great recommendations, but as, as we're looking at strategies and supporting the work here, we wanna make sure that tribal leaders really understand these recommendations, that they are taken up and integrated at the local community level. So we would really like to work with your staff and colleague staff on maybe potentially thinking of how we could um, get a, a, you know, an amount of uh, resources to the Native Nations Institute to really look at a rollout plan across our Native Hawaiian communities, Alaska Native and American Indian communities. We think that this is an incredible report. As you said when I brought it to you and I said, it's finished, and you were like, yeah, no, long way from being finished, Gloria. We, this is when the work really starts. We, we feel as though with the technical expertise of Dr. Jorgensen, her connections, the work to uh, working in partnership with the tribal uh, national organizations and with the tribes and tribal organizations, that it really makes sense. And so would love to talk with you about that. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. And thank you to, to all the commissioners, all those that um, provided input today know how deeply we appreciate it. And, and really, the work is just beginning. What you have done is you in your listening, and I, I, I got Gil's message there about coming out and hearing um, in the different regions the issues, the concerns, the opportunities, the good examples, the bad examples. And so how, how we then take that, you put this in the report, but far too often that what happens around here is Congress asks for something, the work is done, and then we say thank you very much. And there's no follow through with the implementation. I'm reminded of this because I just uh, penned a letter with um, Senator Cortez Masto um, on the recommendations from the, uh, from the Not Invisible report. And we want a reporting from the agencies about where they are following that report. So this is, this is kind of on us to do that level of oversight to say, all right, agency, we've got these bills that were, were recommended. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we, we have put in place some of the other things. We, we know we can be doing more, but we need to be doing a check back in, too, to make sure that this report continues to, to give and to benefit children and families um, around the country. Again, whether you are Native Hawaiian, Alaska Native American Indian, regardless of where you are, that we are, we are we're gaining from the wisdom and, and the content that you have pulled together. So we have a lot of work to do. Do not be shy to pester us about what, what became of that. What can we do if, if it's getting resources to um, the, uh, the Native Foundation? What was the name of it? Native Nations Institute. Native Nations Institute. See, I need to be reminded. Um, we, need to be, we need to be prompted on this as well. So it kind of goes as a two-way street. Maybe your term as commissioners is over, but now you're, you're really in charge as as a citizen uh, legislator out there to continue to push 
um, push us in Congress, but also in the state. And I'm really proud, uh, Gloria and Don, what you did to, to put that before the judiciary and the education committees in our state legislature. And I would challenge the rest of you, go back to, to Minnesota, to North Dakota, and, and, and ask your legislators, take this up, review it. Where can we implement state policies that will dovetail with uh, what is happening at the federal level and at the local level? So we do, we've got a lot of work to do, but um, uh, we now have greater definition because of the heart that you have put into it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to encourage panelists and those tuning in to submit any written testimonies to testimony at indian.senate.gov by May 22nd. And this roundtable is adjourned. <laughs>